Oh, thanks. So William touched on a lot of ideas on sort of an introduction to visual analytics. And so what I want to cover is more sort of very specific topics very quickly to give you a high level overview of different sorts of things you might look at or might think about for your own visual analytics applications. And again, we get back to this idea of we have this ongoing data deluge. Uh, for example, FedEx ships more than eight and a half million packages per day. Um, there was an interesting uh, McKinsey report where UPS analyzes their traffic patterns, right? We now have GPS tracking in our phones and all of our trucks. If their trucks make all right turns instead of left turns, they can save about a billion dollars of gas a year. So taking a look at this data, solving these problems of big data, um, consumers carry a billion Visa cards worldwide. I can take that, calculate your information. Um, if you're familiar with Tesco, Tesco records all of your um, purchase, right? You need your Tesco card when you go there to get your discount. In the U.S., there's a store called Target. Target works with uh, Visa to analyze your sorts of purchase data. And one day in the mail, a young woman got, um, she was about 16, and her dad opened her mail, and she had a mail article saying, you know, you can buy diapers and all these things for kids. And her dad was really upset. Why would Target be sending her information about buying diapers? She's only 16. Well, it turns out she just hadn't told her dad yet that she was pregnant, and Target already had figured this out from all of her information. So being able to analyze and explore all this different sort of uh, data is really, really important. So we have huge amounts of data available in digital form and ready for analysis. We want to be able to make sense of this data. And this Dilbert comic sort of summed this up nicely where we have this information is gushing towards your brain like a fire hose aimed at a teacup. So the idea is that we want to take all of this data and we want to transform it into information and then from that information gain insight. Um, but if we have all this terabytes of data, it doesn't really matter, right? I can collect terabytes and terabytes of data. It's really how many petaflops of insight can we generate. So the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. Um, and this was from Hamming in 1971 talked about this. We don't, it doesn't matter how fast I can compute things. If I can't gain insight from what I'm computing, it doesn't matter. And so we want to use visualization to help make data understandable to people. So let's go through a nice example. This is from um, a data chart of animals. So I have animals, I have brain weight, and I have body weight, right? So what are some of the questions you might want to ask? Well, which animal has the highest brain weight? Which animal has the highest body weight? Those sorts of things. Um, and is there a relationship between brain weight and body weight? And if so, are there any outliers? And it's really hard to do in this table, right? I mean, I can look through the columns and I can look at all 28 entries and I can see the Triceratops is 9,400 pounds and then I see later the Brachiosaurus is more. And I have to remember this information and compare in this sort of tabular context as opposed to if I just plot it, I can quickly find the largest body mass in the upper right and largest brain mass in <coughs> grams. But now we go back to our earlier question, is there any relationship between brain weight and body weight? And it seems that, yes, as we get higher sort of body weight, we get higher brain weight too. But does that necessarily mean that the point in the upper right-hand corner is the smartest animal? Well, we know the animal in the upper right-hand corner must be one of those dinosaurs, right? Don't worry. <laughs> so if we're looking at things like this and giving some general sort of trend of body mass and brain, when we ask these sorts of questions of which animal is the smartest, if we don't really think too much about this graph, we may just say, well, there's an upper trend, so smartest must have highest <clears throat> brain mass. But really, it's sort of a percentage, right, of brain weight to body mass. So if we label all of these, we can see uh, that in the upper right-hand corner, we get the blue well and the elephant, um, as opposed to somewhere in the middle section there, we see modern man and dolphin. Instead, if we modify our graph and plot it, plot it by log of brain weight minus log of body weight, now we get an ordering that we're probably more comfortable with in terms of ranking in terms of intelligence. So we get modern man, dolphin, um, etc. And so again, we can think about how we can use these visuals to interpret data, but we also have to be careful not to lie with visualization. There's a very nice book on how to lie with statistics, and there's a panel at the visualization conference typically on how to lie with visualization. So being careful about how we represent things is a very common sort of factor. And visualization has been around a long time. Um, William showed you a lot of examples. I'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, this is a hand-drawn illustration of water by da Vinci. So looking at flow studies, trying to illustrate how water flows. 
we moved to the famous cholera map of John Snow. So he took all the epidemic cases for cholera, plotted them on a map, and came to the conclusion that he should shut down a particular well in London. Um, this is a very <clears throat> famous sort of map and a very interesting story behind it. If you're so inclined, you can buy a nice book to read about it, whether or not this actually helped him solve the problem or whether or not the well had anything to do with cholera is another sort of story. Um, and then a nice map is Charles Menard's flow map. So what Menard is trying to show is sort of the march and downfall of Napoleon's army. So we start at the left side here, and the width of this sort of brownish bar is this uh, proportional to the size of Napoleon's army. And we see as we march through time to the right here, he gets towards Moscow and the harsh winters now are taking their toll and the army retreats and by the time it gets back to where it started from, it's all but decimated. So we see the size of the flow line telling us this quick story of uh, Napoleon's march on Moscow. And so we can see how quickly visualization can provide us this information and tell us these uh, sorts of stories. A nice vast outing might be to go see James Maxwell's thermodynamic surface sculpture. I think this is at Oxford maybe still. So this was a 3D visualization of Maxwell's sort of thermodynamic fields. So we had this coordinates, we had X is volume, Y is entropy, and Z was energy. So we had people thinking about how to represent these sort of complex mathematical frameworks even back in the 1870s. So visualization is helpful. Hopefully um, you're convinced that it helps utilize the high bandwidth of the human visual system. We're very good at spotting outliers, spotting patterns, and telling stories with these sorts of pictures. Um, we have pre-attentive visual phenomena, which I won't get into in this lecture, but you can take a look at Chris Healy's nice paper on pre-attentive visualization. But essentially, visual tools can extend memory and cognitive capacity. You can think about this in an example. What if I ask you to multiply 73 times 33? It takes you a minute, right? <clears throat> if you had a piece of paper, what you're doing when you're writing down 73 times 33 is you're offloading these different steps of the process. You're using your visual memory, so you're writing down each step and recording this, saving those different steps and improving your cognitive capacity. So we think visually. Um, we always see a picture is worth a thousand words, right? And so that's sort of the idea behind this. And later in the week, you're going to hear about amplifying cognition. Essentially, we want to offload our results. We want to figure out how we can reduce the search time of data, and we want to improve pattern recognition. And visualizations can be designed to control attention interaction for improving cognition. So what is visualization? What do we really mean by this? And there's lots of sorts of definitions, but typically it's the use of computer-supported interactive visual representations of data to amplify cognition. Um, this is not simply the process of making a graphic or an image. So we just want to make a picture of something that's sort of computer graphics. The goal of this is we want to create insight, not pretty pictures necessarily. So you have the difference between working for Pixar and making the movie Brave, as opposed to taking um, visualization and trying to help people gain insight from there. And we really want to help people form a mental image of something and internalize their own understanding. So we want to promote discovery, decision making, and explanations. So essentially we want to find and utilize cognitive and perceptual principles we want to optimize our visualizations as well as our interactions um, according to these sorts of cognitive and perceptual principles. And one example would be, how do people draw a map? So if I was to ask how to get to the Greyhound, probably William could draw me a map on a napkin like this, and it's not going to quite look like the map that uh, Simon showed with the nice Google Maps there, right? He's going to um, draw me some street markers like this, point me to some landmarks and those sorts of things. So we can think about how we can combine these sorts of cognitive principles with automated mapping. And so in this paper, Mish Agrawal came up with sort of how do we create these hand-drawn sorts of maps to help people better look at roots. And so in visualization, we want to see how we can combine these principles into creating novel sorts of ways to look at data and to understand data. Now, visualization is primarily broken up into scientific visualization and information visualization. And both of these can be thought um, of in similar terms. When we talk about scientific visualization, we're typically talking about representing something physical or something that has a geometric structure. So flow over an airplane wing, 
um, MRI, CT data, so we have a scan, a medical image scan, uh, organs in the human body, molecular bonding, those sorts of things. As opposed to information visualization, primarily it does not have a direct physical correspondence. Um, maybe the exception to that would be geographic visualization is often categorized in information visualization, the same sort of thing, <laughs> but our data is abstract in some sense. You can think of things like baseball statistics, stock trends, uh, my social network, all of these sorts of things I imply some sort of structure to and imply some sort of uh, visual to, as opposed to if I take an MRI scan of your body, that structure is already there. There's a relationship between all of the data elements to form that uh, reoccurring picture. Now, the purpose of visualization is essentially comes down to analysis. We wanna understand our data and we wanna act upon that given understanding. So you see all these sorts of jobs now for data analysts. The New York Times is reporting that there um, is pretty much a completely underserved field in data analytics. Um, in fact, the New York Times itself just hired um, one of the co-creators of D3. So um, Michael Bostock, I'm pretty sure that's the right one. <laughs> there were several people. Michael Bostock now works for um, doing the graphics. So you see a lot of nice, really neat interactive data visualizations in the New York Times. So if you just Google New York Times interactive visualization, you'll see all these D3 graphics of looking at President Obama's policies, looking at changes in the stock market, all sorts of <laughs> fun little things. Um, but visualization is most useful in sort of exploratory data analysis. So we take our data, we make pictures of it, we interact with it, and we're sort of exploring. So we have the information seeking mantra from Schneiderman where we wanna overview the data, <laughs> zoom and filter, and then provide details on demand as part of this exploratory process. And it winds up that there's sort of certain tasks that people go through. So we might wanna search and browse for a particular piece of information. So we're gonna expect our, <laughs> inspect our data. Uh, then analysis, we wanna do comparisons. Typically we say, okay, what's the difference between this and this? Are there outliers, are there extrema? Do I see a repeated sort of pattern in my data? And then if we have this real-time sort of data, we wanna monitor it, right? We wanna look for trends, look for changes, look for anomalies and communicate that. So contained within the data of any investigation is information that yield conclusions to questions not even originally asked. And this goes back to um, Jim Thomas, his book where he talks about visual analytics being to um, detect the unexpected. So we want to be able to confirm what we already know as well as detect what's unexpected in our data. So we wanna help people by showing them a picture of their data. Um, one common example I have of this would be I'll get data from people and they say, oh, my data follows a certain pattern. And then you'll plot just a typical time visualization of that. You'll show their data by day of week or something. And they'll say, well, I have the most cases of crime on a Friday. And when you plot their data by day of week, it turns out they have the most cases of crime really on a Saturday. So either there's an error in the data or they just have an error in their sort of mental model. Um, I'll always hear that crime and hospital things once there's a full moon, all the crazies come out and I get more people at the emergency department, I get more people in jail. There's no evidence to back that up whatsoever. But people have that mental model in their head that this is the sort of thing that's occurring. So is visualization the total solution? Well, we probably wouldn't call this visual analytics if we thought visualization was a total solution. Um, traditional visualization misses several key factors in how people solve difficult problems. And so visual analytics came along to try to overcome some of these shortfalls, um, augmenting what we already know as visualization. We want to combine this human computer exploration and decision making. So we want to take machine learning, HCI, cognitive sciences, visualization. And we want to take tools from all these different disciplines and combine them together to create these solutions. So like I said, visualization is good for exploring data, but we want to do more than just explore, right? So visual analytics is a science of analytical reasoning facilitated by interactive visual interfaces. And what we wanna do is we wanna combine automated analysis techniques. There's lots of great machine learning techniques out there. So why shouldn't we be applying these to help us um, discover the expected and detect the unexpected in our data? We wanna take a look at these very large data sets. We only get so many pixels on a screen. We only get so much screen resolution. There's only so much that humans can perceive. So we need to determine what's most important what's most salient in our data. 
And a graphic display has a lot of purposes, but it can achieve its highest value when it forces us to see what we're not expecting. So taking pictures of the data, taking snapshots, showing different visual forms and looking at data in different ways can help us detect these sort of unexpected types of problems. And my computer died. Yeah, I've got, it says it's plugged in. I don't know what happened. Hmm. That's okay, that was a good. <laughs> yep. Ah, here we were. Don't worry. 24 out of 180. We're good. <laughs> so, how we talk? All right, so as we talked about, the foundations of visual analytics are trying to take information and knowledge from a whole range of discipline, from data management to graphics to cognitive and perceptual sciences. And we want to talk about some of these different factors today. So, like I said, visualization, this is really hard to do without. So I don't have to try to turn around the whole time. We'll see. So we talked about visual analytics. We talked about the graphic display has many purposes. So let's go through a quick example visual analytics system. So um, all sorts of different topics we could take a look at. For this example, I want to talk about syndromic surveillance. And essentially, this is the detection of adverse health events using pre-diagnosis information. So when you go to an emergency department and when you go to a doctor, you're going to get your patient record taken. And if I can get that patient record prior to your test being run, is there information in there that will let me sort of detect anomalies and outbreaks earlier than if I wait for these tests? Can I use things like over-the-counter medicine sales? Can I use news reports on emerging diseases? Can I combine all of these different data sources together to sort of detect early health events. And so in 2010, VAST put together um, sort of different scenarios, and one of them was doing this sort of early detection. So you had a set of data, patient IDs, date, chief complaint, and location. And we want to explore this and look for anomalies and outbreaks and determine sort of where this underlying hidden disease was. So what we can do is we can take our first step and we can apply an automated analysis, right? So I don't want to have to just plot the data. I can actually take the data, and if I'm only given these sorts of text fields, why can't I turn those into some sort of category? So I can do some sort of text analysis, turn those into categories of interest um, specifically related to disease anomalies. So I can use what was called a COCO classifier, turn those into these eight sorts of categories, and then I can plot my count per category per day, and I can look for anomalies doing time series analysis. So where these red dots are, those are places where I had a higher number of cases than I expected. And so we can sort of see the onset of the outbreak and the peak and it dying off over time. We can also take a look and try plotting these over country. We can plot all sorts of different statistics about these. But essentially what we want to think about is how can we combine this sort of automated analysis? We do text analysis. Um, time series, control charting, different graphics. How can we combine these in an interactive way to allow people to explore their different sorts of data? And now I just said a lot of sort of key words there. We want to now look at specific sorts of methods for visualization, for automated analysis, and talk about some different tools that you can think about applying in your own work. So another example here would be looking at emergency department chief complaints. So this is the state of Indiana. Anytime somebody goes to a hospital in Indiana, I get a record. And so I can actually look for rates of syndromes per day. You could scroll through time. You could change the aggregate. So you could look at a week's worth of data. You could look at a month's worth of data. Um, you can quickly interactively filter, look for keywords. 
look for particular demographics, show the hospital, show the heat map. And what happens is we want to sort of interrogate our data, right? So we can think about doing hypothesis generation and testing. So in this case, the analyst just wants to look at gastrointestinal illness. We see a plot of the state. The analyst finds a hot spot of interest. So they say this hot spot typically doesn't exist. They interactively select that area, pull up the time series chart. And on the back end of this time series chart is control <coughs> chart analysis. So the last day is today's date. We see that actually there was an anomaly there. There was more cases on that day than we expect in that area. So from there, the analyst might say, okay, well, let me try to confirm that. So they'll select the hospital in that area, look at the hospital control chart. We see there's no anomalies though going on at the hospital in terms of time series. So we can then filter our data down. Maybe we only want to look for gastrointestinal cases with fever. Turns out in that region, there's only one case, sparse time series data. You wind up with lots of sorts of anomalies because it's sparse. You could go drill down into this one case and take a look at that particular patient, or you could move on with your analysis and then look at the next hotspot. So you can quickly sort of help <clears throat> come up with hypotheses and allow sort of expert analysts to build a mental model of whether or not they need to explore these hypotheses further. So we are trying to create these sorts of tools for hypothesis generation and exploration. And we want to move further in visual analytics to next start trying to allow for hypothesis testing. So all that seems simple enough, right? We just take the data and we just make pictures of it. So no problem. So. How do we do all this? What are the sorts of techniques? Where do I start exactly? So we have our data. We have some sort of backend database. You might have SQL, no SQL, whatever sort of database your data stored somewhere, somehow. If it's government data, it's often stored in really hard to get CSV files, PDF files, where they have tables that you can't really extract very easily. So you have to figure out how to get your sort of data. Uh, and there's structures that exist in the original data. So if I have and geographic data, the structure is sort of latitude and longitude, um, or there may be structures that are derivable from the original data. Maybe I want to take derivatives of certain fields, look at these things, and this structure retains information and knowledge content and related context within the data. And what I can do with these structures is transform them into lower dimensional representations for visualization and analysis. So data models are mathematical abstractions. We can perform numerical operations on these as opposed to conceptual models, these are mental constructs where we want to have this sort of semantic structure and support reasoning. So we can think about giving directions to someone using landmarks. So I might say, take a right by the Tesco and continue on down Highway A1 or whatnot, but I'm giving that sort of landmark of the Tesco as opposed to the data model itself, that would be sort of the coordinates, the latitude and longitude points. And Stevens sort of broke down data types into four specific categories. We considered nominal data, whereas data whose categories have no implied ordering. Um, you can think of this as an example of political affiliations of a population. So in the US, you have um, Democrats and Republicans, um, and you don't want to imply that one is better than the other, so we consider that nominal data. Ordinal data has some sort of specified order. but there's no specified distance metric. So examples might include a uh, beverage size at McDonald's. If they don't label the size of the cup, they say small, medium, large, and there's an implied ordering, we may not know the distance between them. As opposed with interval data, we actually have measurable distances. You can think of this as periods of time, uh, but the zero point is arbitrary. In ratio data, it's same as interval, but it includes a non-arbitrary zero point. So for example, Celsius scale, height above sea level, those sorts of things. And what we want to do is we want to take these different data types and map them to an appropriate visual representation. Um, so we have this sort of visual analytics pipeline. William showed a nice uh, prettier version from Daniel Kimes' book. But essentially we want to have data analysis where we take the data and we prepare them for visualization. So oftentimes we're going to need to interpolate the data, smooth it, transform it into some representation and form. Uh, then typically what will happen is you want to filter it. We have so much data in this data deluge, we can't possibly show it all, all on the screen or process it all at once. So we need to figure out how we want to filter it. We want to think about intelligently filtering it and subsetting it. Then we want to map the data. So we're going to turn that data into geometric primitives. So if I have a latitude longitude point, put it on the map. If I have MRI, a sort of CT scan of the body, 
I want to figure out how to represent that. And then finally, once I figure out the mapping, I need to then do a rendering. So I need to take it and put it on the screen. I need to make the pictures happen. And so essentially, I'm creating these visual representations that are transforming data into a visible form. It's going to highlight important features. We want to highlight commonalities and anomalies. And we want to make it easy for users to perceive salient aspects of their data quickly. Um, these representations augment the cognitive reasoning process with perceptual reasoning, and it's going to enhance the underlying analytical reasoning process. And visualization is concerned primarily with mapping to a visual form. And so Bertin in his book, The Semiology of Graphics, um, said there's really only about seven visual forms. You get position, size, value, color, texture, orientation, and shape. And he sort of pointed out how these are. So we get a position on the paper. I can make a mark. I can give that mark a size. That size can represent some data value. I can give that mark a value or a color, a texture, an orientation. These are the sorts of things people are able to perceive, so we're forced down to a limited number of visual variables. And we can take a look at Wilkinson's grammar graphics. He talked about more sorts of visual variables, I looked at things like optics, how we can look at blur, transparency, breaking color into saturation, hue, and brightness, looking at shape, size, rotation. So the question becomes then, if I have these sorts of seven visual variables, how many of these variables do I use? What are the number of variables necessary for representation? Well, if I have 10 data components that I want to visualize and I only have seven visual variables, then I'm out of luck, right? I can't visualize all 10 of them. I can't use color to <laughs> represent two different sorts of things. I can't make a map where color is heat and where color is amount of rainfall. Now, that's not exactly true. I can use vibrate color map and try some more complicated schemes, but essentially you're limited to sort of the ways of these seven visual variables. So with three components, the information can be perceived as a single image um, in terms of our three-dimensional space. If we want to take these multivariate data and have a color for heat, rainfall, um, all these different sorts of things, oftentimes we'll take several images and we call those small multiples. And the number of components in our data is really the best basis for a classification of graphic constructions. So we wanna figure out how we are going to build these different graphics. So we decide how we're going to choose the different visual encodings. And so McKinley in his paper talked about automating the design of graphical um, presentations. So we see it as sort of quantitative ordinal and nominal data. And McKinley talks about how you can properly choose different encodings. So when you're thinking about how to design your various visualizations, these are the sorts of papers you need to start and think about, bringing in that sort of perceptual learning to understand where to begin in choosing these variables. And one of the key variables is always color, right? So how do we express data with color? Uh, well, results from visual attention can be used to assign visual features to data but there's no really best color scale. Instead, the choice is gonna depend on the data type, the problem domain, the visual representation, and what questions I wanna ask in my data. And so while I say there's no best choice, there are certain design principles that we wanna follow. So our design principles include order, separation, and aesthetics. So in order, what I mean is that if I have a univariate data type, so let's say I'm going from small to large in my McDonald's cup, my scale should also look like it goes from small to large. So if I want to map everybody's height in the room to a color, I'm not going to map my height to green and somebody else's height to red. I would map them to varying shades of green where light might be shortest and dark green might be tallest. And then what comes next is separation. I need to be able to tell the difference between each of these chunks of color. If I can't tell the difference, then I can't perceive those as different items. And not only should they be perceived, but that separation should be equal. So I should somehow be able to map that in my mind that this change from light green to the next shade of light green is equal to the change to the next shade. And then aesthetics, this is sort of the tricky one. You want it to look pretty. Um, you want it to be pleasing and contain a maximum perceptual resolution. And the ordering should be intuitive. I shouldn't necessarily have to explain things to you. It should be very quick to pick up uh, simply based on looking at the image. So we wind up with several different color schemes. For the univariate color scheme, we have a rainbow map. It's one of the most commonly used 
but it's really a poor choice for a large variety of domain problems. The ordering here is unintuitive. Why is dark blue necessarily less than red if we go from low to high, or why is that bigger than yellow? Um, but nominal data types can be used with this scale. There's no ordering implied in nominal data, so we can have Republicans be red, Democrats be blue. There's no necessarily implied ordering. So using this sort of scale for qualitative um, data is, or I'm sorry, nom nominal data is common. Now, if we have ordinal data, um, the simplest is to use a sequential color scheme. So we have from low to high. So we'll have low values with light colors, high values as dark colors. <clears throat> and the benefits are that the scale is intuitive. So we see the range changing over <clears throat> the colors. But the weakness is there's a limited number of distinguishable colors that humans can perceive. So we're limited to a certain number of color bins that we can tell the difference between. In cartography, uh, the rule of thumb is seven to nine different colors on a map. And then the last one to talk about would be that divergent color scheme. So we want to provide means for variable comparisons. We want to have a best suited for sort of ratio data where we have this given zero point. So for example, height above sea level, height below sea level. The white here would represent sea level, and then you can see how far above or below you are. Um, again, you can think of with the Celsius scale, zero is freezing, how far above or below freezing. So we can make careful choices about choosing high and low ends and essentially want to think about the different concepts. Can we formulate aesthetics into this? We have this concept maybe of cool blues and warm reds and yellows. So how do we combine this into choosing a particular color scheme? And then we can try even more complicated things. We could try a multivariate color scheme. So we could combine different color maps together and have variable one and variable two. So we could have things like precipitation and temperature. And if we're in the upper right dark corner there, we have high precipitation and high temperature. But what they find is that as we start expanding on these schemes to multidimensional, multivariate color schemes, they get harder to interpret. I have to think very hard about what my mapping is. So this increases my cognitive burden. I have to think about what this color actually represents. So I have to think, okay, this light blue color represents sort of medium V1, but very low V2. So I have to always go back and think about these things. With three variables, it becomes even more complicated. And that's not to say you can't do it, and there might be good reasons for it in your visual design. <clears throat> so with all of these different visual variables, the obvious question should be, which one is the best? If I have these seven visual variables, what should I start with? And so Bill Cleveland wanted to um, evaluate these in isolation. So he wants to look at each one independently and see which ones were the best. And his test for this was to have people do magnitude and ratio comparisons. So can you quickly tell which item is bigger? What's the magnitude of the difference here? And so he found that positioning the items along common scale was the best, and people were the worst at sort of doing this magnitude and ratio distance with color. And we have all these sorts of things in between. Now, research, though, indicates this hierarchy might be best in pre-attentive stages. So we're only for focusing on a portion of the graphics. And again, this is a relatively constrained sort of experiment. But this gives us some idea of where to begin. So if those are looking at the encodings in isolation, what happens if I combine the area of an object with the color? Can I represent one quantitative dimension with color and another with orientation, with shape, with size? And if I do that, can a perceiver respond to both dimensions? Can you quickly tell the difference in size and the changes in color? Or do I combine these in my head somehow perceptually and see a whole different sort of phenomenon than what you're trying to teach me or trying to explain to me. So I want to figure out, do these things make psychological sense? And so what it breaks down into is that actually these visual variables wind up either being integral or separable. So if they're integral, that means there's some interaction going on. So if I'm putting a color in an area, as that area gets bigger and smaller, my perception of that color actually changes. I didn't change the color at all, but my perception of the color over this area changes. <laughs> Integral dimensions are not easily decomposable by the perceiver. So trying to figure out what the two dimensions are in our scale becomes difficult. 
So for example, if I want to map hue, brightness, and saturation to different variables, it is really hard for a perceiver to tease out a difference in hue versus a difference in brightness sometimes. So they're hard to decompose um, compared to things like, let's say, size and texture, for example. So the trick is we want to pick the best encoding from our visual properties. So how do we do this? Well, again, that's why you take a course on visualization longer than this. You look at different perceptual studies, <laughs> psychology. Um, but essentially, what we want to make sure is that we have the principal consistency. So the property of the images should match the property of the data. I don't want to be lying to you with my visualization. I don't want to choose the wrong sort of integral encoding where it's actually being perceived as something different than the data is telling me. And I want the principle of importance ordering. So I want to encode the most important information in the most effective way. And so that's really sort of the key thing there is the most important information. So the question you should ask next is, well, how do I know what's most important? How do I decide what's most important? And we'll get to that in a little bit. But let's take a look at McKinley's um, automating the design of graphical perception. So here's a bar graph. What do we think this bar graph is showing? Well, all this bar graph is really showing is where a car was made. But if I look at this, I look it's like, oh, Volvo is winning something, right? It has a bigger bar than everything else. So what McKinley was trying to explain is that there's poor choices of visual design. We want to make sure not to sort of be tricking people with these strange sorts of graphics. There's a time and a place for a bar chart. There's a time and a place for a point graph. And perhaps doing these sorts of things, we're just doing categories as points, is easier for people to tell the different uh, nationalities of the different cars. And again, maybe there's a better representation than this. But what he tested was sort of how well people perceive these, how well people understand these different charts. So we'll take coffee break in just a minute, right? Okay. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. I'll come to a good stopping point. <laughs> So if we have all of these dimensions, we have all this higher order of data, we only have seven visual encodings, what do we do? And really as data gets bigger and bigger in dimensionality, we wind up with this idea of this curse of dimensionality. So it really is referring to the problems associated with multivariate data analysis. So as the dimensionality increases, the data becomes sort of sparse in those areas too. If data is sparse, that's a problem for most statistical methods for finding significance. And sometimes data dimensions are redundant. So if I'm measuring things like height and weight, often those are very correlated. So if I can find one measure, um, you can think of BMI, I can get rid of height and weight altogether and combine that down to one variable. So if I have these sorts of redundant information, how do I combine these? And then we've also talked about we're limited in visualization, not only to visual variables, we're also limited to screen space. So I can make um, all sorts of small multiples, right? We could do, um, take everybody's data in the room, right? We get height, hair color, eye color, gender, GPA, social security number, all sorts of things. We could plot all of this data, but I'm limited to the amount of pixels I can get on the screen. So it's very hard to keep adding variables and plotting all of these. So we want to choose the most appropriate dimensions. We want to choose the most important dimensions. So what can we do? <clears throat> well, Things we can think about doing is we can incorporate prior knowledge of the data. Uh, we can smooth to a target function. And of course, we can try to reduce the dimensionality. And there's practicality amongst this curse. So for a given sample size, there's really a maximum number of features above which the performance of classifying samples will degrade rather than improve. What I mean by this is I'm trying to find some sort of cluster, some sort of pattern. I want to match you to your different features of your data. I want to figure out what's important. And so there's a limited number of features that will sort of tell me the importance about data. It will tell me how well I can model this data based on these features to predict if I get a new data element, what that data element might consist of. So what we want to decide is how do we throw features away? What features are most important? And what this is implying for visualization and visual analytics is that there's some features of the data set that are better to visualize that contain more information than others. So this is probably a good stopping point if we want to do coffee and yeah, come thank back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ross. So, okay, thanks for coming back after coffee break. So we stopped. We were talking about um, the curse of dimensionality and how we have all these 
sorts of visual variables, but we have way more variables in our data set than we can ever possibly represent on the screen. So this sort of leads us to the idea then of using some sorts of machine learning, particularly uh, dimension reduction. We want to figure out what the most salient aspects of our data are and reduce it to those dimensions in order for visualization and analysis. So feature extraction is essentially creating a subset of new features by combining existing features. So I can make a new variable in my data set. If I have a variable of your height, age, race, gender, weight, I can make a new variable that is some age plus gender is this new variable, right? I can do some weird combinations of things. And feature selection, instead of be choosing a subset of all the features, so I can manually reduce down. And an optimal mapping would be one that doesn't increase errors. So I can reduce down to a smaller set of features. I don't um, introduce any error into my data set, but that doesn't happen very often. One of the most commonly applied dimensional reduction techniques is principal component analysis. And this is essentially a deterministic analytical procedure that's going to utilize an orthogonal transformation to reduce a set of sample observations that may be correlated. So if my weight and height are correlated, I can reduce those down to one single variable with that correlation factor and sort of determine the new vector in my data. So I can change these to new components. And the number of principal components is always going to be less than or equal to the number of original variables in my data set. So just because I do PCA doesn't mean I will get less variables. It will look to see if I can get less variables. The other problem is if I make this new variable that is my combination of height and weight, do people understand these new variables, these new strange sorts of transformations? So I've taken two variables, um, done some sort of correlative analysis and made a new variable. How well do people understand these for analysis? The main limitation of PCA is it doesn't really consider class label of the feature vector. So instead, it's just going to do a coordinate rotation, align the transform actions <coughs> axis with the directions of maximum variance. So the nice thing about this is it's sort of going to give me a reduced set of dimensions where the first principal component that's returned has the highest maximum variance. So this is explaining the most variance in my data, which often may be a measure of importance. We say, okay, this, data, this particular variable is good for showing me what's changing the most in the data sets. Maybe that's the one I want to visualize. But there's no guarantee that the directions of maximum variance is going to contain the most interesting or important features. So again, when we want to use these machine learning techniques, we have to think about why we're going to use them, what they're going to tell us, and how we can represent these to other people that don't know what they mean. So many of you probably have heard of PCA. If you wanted to do this by hand, it's probably hard for most people. Um, instead, we use MATLAB and those sorts of things. I haven't gone through all the math because we have one hour to cover a lot of topics. And this is also similar to multidimensional scaling. And in fact, certain flavors of MDS are equivalent to PCA. Um, and you can do all sorts of different sorts of dimensional reduction and transformation. And so in data mining, there's lots of techniques for dimensional reduction. PCA and MDS are linear dimensional reduction. What if I have um, variables that I don't think are linear related? Maybe they are quadratically related. There's techniques for that too. But again, these get more and more complicated. And I have to have a good reason for why I should assume things are linearly, linearly related or why things are quadratically related. But I can use these dimension reduction techniques, these machine learning techniques, to enhance my visualization. Right? I know that I only get a limited set of <clears throat> display space, a limited set of variables. So if I can reduce these to the most salient features, I should try to do that somehow. But we need to think about how to communicate these changes to the data space to the end user. So in visual analytics, we want to know how to best create images of the data effectively. We want to help people spot outliers, discriminate clusters, check distributional assumptions, uh, figure out relationships, compare differences, compare time-based process, compare space-based process, compare space-time processes, compare network processes. The list goes on and on of all the different things we want to do. And there's all sorts of different visual representations we can take. And so for the next hour or so, we're going to cover a very, very wide gamut of different visual <coughs> techniques that you could potentially use for your data. And these are sort of the low level data representations. So the two main ways we can think about <coughs> presenting multivariate data are tables and graphs. And most everybody is familiar with a table. Anybody that's worked with data has seen Excel, has seen an SQL database to some extent. So they know what a table looks like. The problem is I can only fit so much text on a screen, right? 
if I want to think about an exabyte of data, that's, I think that's 10 to the 51. So that takes me 52, 53 characters just to write out that number. That's just to write out what an exabyte is, let alone try to imagine showing exabytes worth of data on a screen. So we need to decide how we're going to represent this, what to use, and when. So when should we use a table? Well, we should use a table when the individual values are the most important, when I want to see exactly what that number is, when I want to see exactly what that feature element is, I need to have some sort of textual representation. Precise values are required, and the quantitative information to be communicated involves multiple units of measure. So I need to relate minutes, seconds, feet. I can use a graph when I'm interested in the shape of the value, the change, the overall distribution. It's very hard to get that sort of shape of the data from a table, right? We looked at that with the animal brain weight sort of distribution. It's very hard to think about how that would look once we have a graphical picture. We can quickly see the shape and look for relationships. People are very, very good at spotting those sorts of trends. So graph, I'm going to use the word graph a couple different ways. Um, right now, let's just think of a graph as the typical 2D bar chart, line chart, those sorts of graphs that we're used to seeing, that they visually display one or more relationships between entities. And this is a shorthand way to present information. So I'm taking a big table of data, and maybe I'm just taking one column of my data, one vector, one feature of my data, and I'm going to make a graph of it to show the distribution, to show a trend or a pattern. Now, why do I want to use a graph? It's very important to remain task-centric. So when you're designing a visual analytics system, what questions are people going to be asking? What do they want to do? Do they just want to explore with the data? In that case, you may want to provide them with a lot of different representations. Is there a particular question they're trying to ask of the data? And if so, does that guide you to the sort of important features you want to look at? And who's the audience? So there's a big difference between a data analyst and a CEO. And I need to think about how to take the information. I may have done exploratory data analysis, drilled down into the weeds, looked at all this data, done all these crazy statistics. I get 30 seconds with my CEO. I can't explain to him, well, my R squared fit is 0.72 and I got a PVA. He's done by then. He doesn't care what you just told him. He needs you to tell him what actionable items you have found that he needs to make a decision on and why you think the decision you are presenting him is the best course of action. So one of the most common graphs, most common visualizations we always start with is a histogram. This is your typical first look method. If I'm going to be a data analyst, the first thing I will do is look at the distribution of my variables. It's going to show me the shape. Um, it's going to let me figure out sort of where I have outliers. And what's the average? What's normal in my data set? The problem is, again, we need to think about how to design this visualization. A histogram has bins. The width of that bin is going to drastically change how this distribution looks. We have, what, 40 people in this room? So if we want to do a graph of the distribution of height, if I only use one bin, it's not going to show me any sort of distribution, right? It's just going to show me a bin. There's no best number of bins, uh, but instead the different bin size lets me see sort of different salient representations of the data. And there's a lot of methods at work to determine an optimal number of bins, but you have to be careful with those too. They assume some knowledge of the underlying distribution of the data. So common methods would be just to simply find the max and the min of the data, and then you might pick some bin width. So if I'm doing grade distribution, grades in the US go from a zero to a hundred scale, um, with grades being about every 10%. So maybe I break my grade scale up into tens. And so my H might be 10 in that case. The other option could be that I know how many bins I want to have, K, and I can solve for H. So in these sorts of histogram binning problems, you either need to know the bin width that you want, or you need to know the number of bins that you want. The square root choice <clears throat> simply says if I have N data elements, so again, let's think of our group here. I have 40 data points. I have everybody's height. I want to know how many bins to take. I would take the square root of 40 and then take the ceiling of that would give me an approximate for K <clears throat> would be a reasonable choice under my square root assumption. Sturgis formula would say take the log. Scott's choice would look at the standard deviation of the data. So it's actually taking the data first, computing a standard deviation, and then making the bin width based on that. And the Friedman-Diaconis rule is looking at the inter 
um, quartile range. So it's looking at the distribution between the um, third and first quartile, quartile. So looking at that spread. So you can also allow the user to define the bin width. We can interactively look at these. So this example is baseball batting average. So I've taken the top 20 players from the US um, based on their batting average, done a histogram binning, chosen a user defined bin width of 0.04. And now we can look at this with the square root choice. And I can take a look at the different distribution. Here at this range, I can see there's sort of a gap in my data. The square root choice fills in that data. We can take a look at Sturge's formula with the three. And so all of those different things sort of show us different sorts of pictures of the data. And of course, this is a limited sort of 20 set example, but as your data gets bigger and bigger, hopefully you're getting the idea that the bin width matters quite a bit. Now the drawback is the density estimate depends on the starting position of the bin. So wherever I put my first position here is gonna drastically influence different things. And there's discontinuities of the estimate are not due necessarily to underlying density. It just may be an artifact of where I chose the bin location. Um, so histograms are typically best suited for quick visualization in just one or maybe two dimensions. We'll talk about how to look at two dimensions. Um, by using this sort of stacked bar graph. So now each element in my bin can be labeled with something else. We can use that for a secondary visualization. Here I've labeled all of the different baseball players in their different bins as I've graphed them. So you can look at different sorts of users based on their now runs batted in. You can see who has the most run batted in, see their distribution over our stacked bar graph. Now, but hopefully you're starting to see some of the problem with this visualization. This takes a lot of text. This takes a lot of screen space. This is only 20 samples. <clears throat> so how am I going to show this if I have 200 samples? 20 is not very many. This won't scale even to 40. So now we start thinking about interaction. We can think about hovering a mouse over a bin and having that mouse tip link to the text, having the mouse tip link to <clears throat> coordinated multiple views and other sorts of things. We start bringing in that interaction component to help overcome some of these problems with overplotting. We can move on to a scatter plot. Hopefully most of you are familiar with a scatter plot instead of a histogram. Now we're mapping two variables, one to the x-axis, one to the y-axis. And this is going to visualize those two variables and it's good for analyzing bivariate relationships. Now I can see the relationship between the number of runs and the batting average. And it shouldn't be too surprising if you know anything about baseball, the more often you hit the ball, the more likely you're gonna score, right? So the more higher your batting average, the higher your number of runs, we sort of see this upward trend in our data. Again, we're looking for these different sorts of trends. We can also see outliers and quickly assess the outliers. So we see this guy over here, he has a high batting average, but he sure doesn't have a whole lot of runs compared to everyone else. Other things we can do, we can do statistical analysis. We can do linear regression, put a line through the data to help us see where different trends are. But putting that line through the data may also mislead the viewer as well. Just because I did a statistical analysis and said, here's my trend line, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Linear regression will give you a best fit line. That best fit line may have something, it has different parameters. So a best fit line may have an, <clears throat> a best fit line will have an R squared, which is essentially telling you how much of the variance is being contained in that model. So I can draw a line on here where my R squared is 0.05. That's not a very good fit. So having an R squared of one means a perfect fit. Very low would be no fit. So why would I draw a line if my R squared was very low? I'm trying to then mislead the viewer maybe, or that's the best relationship. Maybe there's no linear relationship between my data. So you need to think about what you're doing. Along with all of those, you have the non-data components of these graphs. The axes and the legends are just as important as the data themselves. I can't interpret this graph, if I erase my x and y axis, all I've done is then point, plot some points on the screen. <clears throat> Poor axis choice and label choices lead to confusing visualizations. Um, we need to think about where we're going to put the axis ticks. Here I've sort of arbitrarily put them at different intervals, but there may be better choices. And what they're doing is they're supporting the estimation and they contribute to the overall appearance, the overall aesthetics. And we talked about how aesthetics are important for color, they're also just important for visualization in, in general. Cleveland in his work suggested choosing scales so that the data rectangle fills up as much of the scale line rectangle as possible. 
And there's new work um, from Pat Hanrahan's group on an extension of Leland Wilkinson's algorithm for positioning tick labels. So there's free online code about using this to try to optimize tick label placement. Now that's a very good follow-on, and there's lots of research on where to put these. And like I said, this new tick algorithm placement, this is available as an R package. I think it's available as MATLAB, and it's also available, I believe, as Java. And I think there's a C++ version even now. And so what this does is trying to space them out to create sort of the maximum amount of spacing in your data. The other thing is the graph aspect ratio. So you can imagine I can plot a line from 0 to 1, and that line can look like this. It can also look like this. All I've done is stretched my data that way and shrunken my data this way. So the aspect ratio of the graph can greatly change how your graph visualization looks. And there's been several methods for automatically selecting the aspect ratio. Uh, Cleveland, in his work, thought that sort of banking lines so that if I have a time series plot, I want the lines to average bank towards 45 degrees. So he takes some average angle and try to optimize the aspect ratio. Newer work again by Hanrahan's group. You can take a look at arc length aspect ratio selection and look more into this topic. So again, you need to think about how do I pick the aspect ratio? How do I pick the tick labels? And those aren't things we necessarily always think about. Along with that, my data has a certain distribution. That's why I looked at the histogram. But the distribution is also going to drastically affect my visualization. You can imagine um, what we call skewed data. So let's say that everybody in this room would be about five foot five, and then we have somebody that's a giant at seven feet tall. If I wanted to graph that data as a histogram, I'm going to have this one outlier all the way over here while everybody else is very near the five foot five area. So do I want to plot that outlier, or do I want to sort of spread that data out to see the range around the five foot five people? Negative skewness would just mean that the tail is on the left side, so it's longer than on the right. And positive skewness is the opposite. So how do I visualize skewed data? Well, the problem is skewness has compressed all these sorts of samples into a very small chunk, and then we've got a few samples spread out over here. So we can overcome skewness. We could automatically remove outliers. So if a number is more than a certain number of standard deviations away from the mean, we would just say, well, we're not interested. We don't want to visualize it. Or we might say, well, that's the most interesting because it's an outlier, so let's take a look and see what we can think about it. And there's interactive techniques. I can zoom, pan, brush, I can look at the overall picture, and then I could zoom in at the sort of median area. And this can help for visual analysis, but not always. What if I want to compare data sets with different SKUs? And what if I want to perform statistical analysis? One of the main assumptions in a lot of strong statistical analysis methods is an assumption of normality. So what we want to do, or what we can think about doing, is preconditioning the data through transformations. And this allows appropriate analysis and visualization. Um, so we can transform data, sometimes, into a normal distribution, into a Gaussian distribution. The nice thing about a Gaussian distribution is it's fully characterized with two parameters. Probability can always be figured out. And most strong statistical measures and tests, the ones you're most common with, I'm sorry, the most, ones you're most familiar with, probably are based on some underlying assumption of normality of the data. But you have to be careful not to characterize non-normal data as normal. I can try to transform my data to reduce skewness, random noise, and try to fit a normal distribution. It doesn't mean that I've done a good job. And one method of doing this is the Box-Cox power transform. So you're just taking your data and raising it to some power lambda. So that's what the square root method comes in. The square root method is taking a square root of the data, 
That's very good for Poisson distribution. The square root will transform a Poisson distribution into an approximately normal distribution. Um, log is good for another distribution whose name escapes me at the moment. But again, there's reasons why in visualization we often try log and square root first is because those are pretty good usually at transforming. And then I can actually use the box Cox method to find the exact lambda. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, we go back to our graph. I've now changed my label from height to square root of height. What's that mean to the analyst? Is it hard for them to interpret what the square root of height is? And there's all sorts of issues in doing these things. But how does this help? Well, let's take a look at some skewed data here. So this is Indiana again. This is a plot of a number of households with a certain income level. So we see we're skewed towards the right. We have very few households with high income level. We have most of the households at a very low income level. And when I plot this on a map, I'm limited to a certain number of color bins. And if I bin up my data, I don't see very many dark blues because I'm skewed. And in fact, I don't really see much separation at the low value because I take that entire range and split it into bins. I lose that fidelity at the low end. And we can also then take a look at the quantile quantile plot and we see we're very curved this way too. What we can do is we can do a power transformation like I talked about. And when I raise this to a certain power of lambda, I get a nice sort of normal looking distribution here. My QQ plot winds up being a nice straight line like I expect. And if we look at this area that's circled here, now we see we get a more fidelity. We see more sorts of <laughs> range of data here. So those dark blue areas there, that's where all the faculty at Purdue lived. So they raise up the sort of income in that census tract in this local area. So you can start gaining local knowledge. Whereas with this map, I can see these are where the surgeons for the key hospital by Indianapolis live or where those dark blue areas are. They make a lot more money than a professor, right? But I may want to know local information about different regions. Other sorts of visualizations that are common we have all sorts of different charts, right? We could think about people's preference of movies. So we can look at Star Wars, Indiana Jones, X-Men. One question might be how to order these different charts. Here, this is just sort of a random ordering uh, this person on the internet decided to place these by. But I could look and see how similar movies are by their popularity. So we can see that Back to the Future is uh, quite similar to Indiana Jones and Star Wars were the matrix, the second and third ones were not that popular at all. So we could think about how to order our data, how to organize this sort of thing as well with these visualizations. Other common things you'll see are tag clouds and wordles. These are visual representations for text data where the size is going to represent some sort of statistical measure. Um, it might in, um, typically be determined by the number of instances of a word. We can extend to more multivariate data instead of looking at two dimensions on the scatter plot. But you can now look at a scatter plot matrix, looking at multiple dimensions, trying to see multiple sort of correlations between these different two dimensions. And another sort of method of looking at this multivariate data is the parallel coordinate plot. So now we have each of our axes being a particular variable. So we go back to our idea of height, weight, income and these sorts of things, and I can now look for correlation between these pairs of variables. So depending on how these lines go between variable three and variable four, I can look and see if those are correlated. They're all following some similar sort of trend. Now, of course, I can move variable four. There's nothing that constrains this axis between being between variable three and variable five. I can reorder all of this to see different pairwise correlations. So the problem with parallel coordinate plots is that I can only really see correlations from B5 to B6 and B5 to B4. If I want to see the correlation between B5 and B3, I need to reorder these. So again, how do I think about the order? Do I go back to my dimensionality reduction techniques, and look for the things that are most important, and use those for some sort of ordering? How do I decide these different things? The other problem is that different variables can take different values with very different ranges. So how do I handle this in my data? Oftentimes, they'll just normalize the data. Again, we can think about doing power transformations and then a normalization. Um, and again, the order of the coordinate plots has a major impact on the result in visualization. And then again, we start thinking about screen space. So here I've only got three variables for my scatter plot matrix. And we see we're already taking up a lot of screen space. With parallel coordinate plots, I've got eight. 
but you can imagine if I have 100 variables, this doesn't scale very well, right? So we want to think about how do we present the most interesting, most important information, and the more variables we get, the more lines we get, and the more clutter we get. So as opposed to a point representing a data element, in a parallel coordinate plot, each line is representing a data element. So this would be a particular person's height, weight, income, those sorts of things. And so each connection there is the value you would take at a given variable. And so you're tracing those lines along the parallel coordinate plot. Um, star plots are basically the same as a parallel coordinate plot, except now they've laid out the axes in a radial manner. So again, you're just connecting different data elements together. These are commonly seen in video games or things like Dungeons and Dragons represent different attributes of people, right? And then you can actually crop these and show different shapes of the star plot to show how people are skewed towards one thing. So in terms of our four variables here, looking at baseball players, we see that Gonzalez was very sort of good at everything as opposed to Boto and, and Fonte. We're not so good at different things. We can compare these different sort of glyphs that we've made to try to analyze our data. And again, these are not necessarily the best representations. And the goal here is to give you an overview of possible different visual representations you could use. Now we've talked about multivariate data, and we've thought about that as being these sort of two-dimensional graphs with axes and labels and things. But there can also be data with connections inherent in the data. So you can think about the common example is Facebook, right? I'm connected to my friends in Facebook. I know those connections. How do I represent this and how do I explore that? And there's a whole research community that's focused on the creation of graph layout techniques. So you could go to the Graph Drawing 2012 conference. I should have updated that to 2013. And you can look at all these techniques for now, not drawing what we call graphs before, but drawing these connected graphs, these network graphs. So what I mean by this type of graph is you have a vertice and an edge. And there's lots of different ways we can represent this as a data structure. We can take an adjacency list, an adjacency matrix, and all this is doing is saying the connection. So in the adjacency list, number one is connected to number three, two is connected to three, and in the matrix, I'm just filling in those connections in the matrix form here. And then we want to think about how we turn this in to a visual representation. So how do I draw this graph? All I've done is given you some sort of structure of what those connections look like, but what do I want to represent this as? And there's been a whole lot of graphic standards proposed for the representation. <clears throat> Typically, and you'll see this in Facebook, the nodes are circles or boxes, and the edge or a line or a simple curve. So a graph drawing algorithm is essentially taking that adjacency matrix and giving it some visual form. But there's nothing in that adjacency matrix that tells me to place this dot here or to place this connection here. I need to decide that I need to impose my visual representation on that particular data. So you can see there's an infinite number of ways to lay out this graph. I could have put this point up here and changed the entire structure of the data. But what we're concerned with is really the usefulness of the drawing or the capability of conveying the meaning and relationships. And we can think about this in terms of aesthetics. And again, an aesthetic might be a measure of different properties, some optimization function. And a classical um, sort of function here would be we want to minimize the number of edge crossings. So I want to make my graph as close to having zero edge crossings as possible. So these graphs I showed here were nice. No edge crossings were there. But once you start getting a lot of data, that's very, very uncommon. Um, other things we might want to think about is how to minimize the area on the screen. We have lots of nodes and links. How do we minimize that? And how do we optimize symmetry? Can I make the graph appear symmetrical across the screen? And there's all sorts of different graph layout algorithms. Perhaps the most common one is the force-directed method. Uh, D3 some, um, supports the force-directed method, so you can go and take your network data and create a force-directed diagram already. And this is just a physical analogy to draw a graph. So we can think of a graph as a system of objects with forces acting between them. <clears throat> so each node is sort of a weight, and each edge is sort of a spring. And so that's how you get this force-directed method. And the sum of the forces on each object is going to be zero. So they're being pulled towards each other, pushed away from each other, depending on their mass and their edge weights. And so the idea is that a balanced system will give a good graph layout. And so these force-directed methods are very common. There's all sorts of those methods. But there's also data dimension methods for drawing graphs. So there's methods that 
take <clears throat> principal component analysis, look at the space, try to reduce the space and use these sorts of vectors to try to lay out the different graph points as well. So like I said, in a force directed method, each node, each vertex is an object of the system and they're going to interact on these forces. And these models typically, these methods typically have two parts. They have the model of force system, so springs, weights, you can think about particles and charges pushing away, and then you have an algorithm for finding that equilibrium in your system. Shortcomings in graph drawing. We talked about our different visual variables. Position in graph drawing is to some extent arbitrary, right? I can put a node anywhere that I want, so I kind of lose that variable position. So I can encode shape, size, color, but all of these things could clash with the basic node link structure. So I want to think about how I could represent multivariate network data, not just network data itself. So that takes us through graphs, but we may also have specific types of graphs like hierarchies. Um, and these are often represented as trees. So you can think of your genealogy, your family tree, right? And there's two main representations of this. <laughs> there's the node link diagram, but there's also the space filling diagram. So our node link diagram, here's my family tree. And this is my kindergarten project, right? I fill in me, I fill in my mom, my dad, and my grandmas. And I'm imposed some sort of ordering, in which case um, these are parents and ancestors. Now techniques for moving away from this, you can see this takes up a lot of screen real estate, right? If I have a really big hierarchy, I run out of screen space really fast and I run out of screen space in this direction, not this direction. So I want to think about how I can fill up the screen to get more real estate. So Plassant um, proposed the space tree to overcome some of these issues in a node link diagram. This was a dynamic rescaling of branches to best fit the available screen space. And they use preview icons to summarize branch topology. So you can shrink down some of these branches, use interaction to try to overcome some of these like we've talked about. <clears throat> There's also the space filling representation where each item is now going to occupy an area. So the highest node in my tree is the overall outline box here. And then each successive level of my hierarchy is the lower box here. So this is the top node, these are the next three nodes, and so forth. And the size and the length of those boxes is going to represent some measured variable for those different nodes. This is typically referred to as an icicle plot. Um, a more common one is from Johnson and Snyderman is the tree map. And so William showed a little bit of that earlier, but it's a space filling representation where children are now drawn inside of their parent. So here we've got the parents drawn on top as we go down. Instead, now our hierarchy is going to be drawn inside of each other. So we're going to use area to encode other variable and data items. So for the tree map, all you're doing is you're changing the orientation of these rectangles at each level of the hierarchy. So I've got my overall hierarchy is the black box, and my next hierarchical level is going to be these vertical cuts. Inside those vertical cuts, here in the middle you're seeing I've got now horizontal cuts and so forth. So we're going down, filling out these different trees using our tree map algorithm, and you can see different variations of the tree map. You can see the nested tree map trying to show sort of the bubble of the hierarchy, trying to show the different levels of the hierarchy here. Um, we've got non-nested and nested in this case. But we can also think about applying data mining to this sort of data as well. There's, uh, if we have our data and we don't have a hierarchical structure, we can impose a hierarchical structure on it. We can do hierarchical clustering to produce this sort of connections to say this is closest to this and create our own hierarchy. Um, and this is often visualized as a dendrogram. Um, it can be visualized with a tree map as well. And what we're doing is we're taking our data sets. So here I've got an example of points in a two-dimensional space, and I've grouped these together. So in hierarchical clustering, all it does is group points by pairs. So it finds the next closest point. Now this becomes a cluster, and it groups that cluster with the next closest point or the next closest cluster, building up these different tree links as we go. So we see one was closest to three, two was closest to five, and then two and five were next closest to four, so they form a super cluster on top of that, and so you keep building up this hierarchy. And again, we can think about using some of these data mining techniques to reduce our dimensionality to get some sort of simpler visual representation to look at clusters, patterns, 
anomalies and those sorts of things in the data to see relationships. Here I'm trying to see how my data is related, even though there may not have been some given hierarchy. So that takes us through sort of network relationships. We can also have spatial relationships in terms of geography. And geovisualization is primarily denoting tools and techniques that are designed to support analyses with a geographic component. And this is built on cartographic principles. So maps have existed for many, many centuries, and what we're trying to do is look for trends over geographic regions. The most common one is the choropleth map. So areas of the map are shaded in proportion to a measured variable. So I have some statistical measure. So you can imagine in each sort of county in the US, I know um, the number of people that make over $100,000, and I could plot this on a map. Coloring is based on classification. Classification is just another word for histogram bidding. So I'm taking my data. I have 3,000 counties in the US. I have some statistical measure. I know how many men live in each county in the US. And I want to reduce this down to a set of histogram bins. I only get seven to nine colors on my map, so I classify these. I do a histogram binning of my measured variable, and I create my choropleth map. Here I've got um, a measurement by county of the amount of hay produced in each county in the US. So I've been my data, I've created a histogram here. Um, so I've got number of acres less than 5,000, 75,000 or more, and I've done each colors. And now again, we can start looking at this and start trying to reason about our data. Here we see lots of hay and alfalfa in the Northwest. We see this sort of hay belt in the center here. This is a typical cattle, rail <laughs> cattle railroad in the U.S. where cattle travels from Texas to slaughtering houses in Kansas City, so you don't want to transport the hay too far. So again, doing these visual representations of the data, we can start trying to do spatial reasoning, analyzing, coming up with hypotheses. So that's my hypothesis on this data. How would we go and test that? Well, maybe we would go and look at geography, confirm with different farmers, things like that. So in coloring a choropleth map, the number of colors completely depends on the number of classes. And in geography, classes and bins, um, we can think of those as the same thing. If we have too many classes, this can overwhelm the user and distract them from seeing trends. And they can compromise legibility. So if I'm trying to use 100 different colors on my map, it's very, very hard to sort of compare the 100 different colors. A typical cartographic rule of thumb is 5 to 7. And again, we go back to our typical coloring schemes, sequential, divergent, and qualitative. Um, if you want more details on mapping as a visual representation, I would suggest you check out Alan McEachern's book on how maps work for me a more detailed view. Um, from choropleth maps, we can then go on to isopleth maps. These are essentially contour maps that are created by interpolating sets of values. If I have a bunch of point-based data, I can create some sort of functional representation of this data and look for these contour lines amongst my data. Interpolation methods you could use would be things like kernel density estimation and Krieging. So this map here is created by doing a kernel density estimation of points of patients that have visited a hospital. So instead of coloring each of my counties, as you saw on the choropleth map, here now you're seeing these sort of contour lines showing up in my underlying data. You can also do things like proportional symbol mapping. Here we're looking at the number of brew pubs in the US and to try to illustrate that to people, they've chosen a symbol being a beer mug. So the bigger the beer mug, the bigger the beer mug, the more breweries in a given location. Now, of course, here you can quickly see some of the problems with proportional symbol maps. Um, as the area gets small, it's hard to fit the symbol onto the map. So in the northeast corner of the United States, I've got all these different beer mugs that are overlapped. I could try drawing a line and putting those out to the side doing that sort of labeling. But again, there's problems with labeling like that where edge crossing could become problematic. But again, there's reasons why you might wanna do this. This is sort of a quick way to look at this and a fun way to sort of communicate information to people. Um, other sorts of things might be things like um, bristle maps where you can try combining multivariate representation. So I can try using the length of a line, color of a line, um, frequency of a line, even the orientation from side of the street. So we go back to the sorts of visual variables we talked about um, from Bertan. So we can try encoding a lot of those into one map for representing multiple things. So here I've encoded theft in daytime and theft in nighttime. 
So I pick the side of the street for daytime, I pick another side for nighttime, and we can find areas quickly where we have high daytime and nighttime theft. And we can see here this is uh, residential areas typically have high daytime theft, commercial areas typically have high nighttime theft. The reason is because people aren't there. I'm not home during the day, I'm at work. I'm not at work during the night, I'm at home. So robbers are opportunistic. You don't typically get robbed while you're at home asleep. And we can even try doing things like overlaying text on the map. So we have different streets, different features on our map, roadways, waterways. We could try labeling those with text. We could think about putting text for the type of crime that's occurred at given roadways. We could try coloring these, changing the size of text, and doing all sorts of different things. But again, that doesn't mean these are good visual representations. <clears throat> it just means these are other options you can think about trying when designing your own techniques. So we talked about links between people in our graph representation space. Another big one is time, right? We always want to think about what's happening over time. Uh, time is an outstanding dimension in Schneiderman's task by data type taxonomy. Time-oriented data is everywhere. We've got stock market, we've got movie trends, um, business, medicine. Um, each data case that we've been talking about is likely to be some instances of time as well. So one variable in your data set is often a date and a time. If we take a random selection of 4,000 graphs from 15 newspapers, uh, we find that 75% of these graphs are time series. So it seems that people are very, very used to at least seeing time series data. And then we can start thinking about what questions people ask of these different visuals. So they want to ask maybe, does a data object exist at a certain time? How long did that object exist? Do we track this over time? How can we see if it emerged into our data set, if it left? What order do objects appear? So if you think about plotting your own personal life history, at what point does some friend enter your life history and what point do they leave? Is there a cyclical pattern to these appearances? Does my friend only appear on payday because they want me to buy them a beer? Um, and which objects exist simultaneously? And you can think about this for all sorts of data. So think about stock market data. How does that change over time? Do two stocks track together? Can I use this to infer information about another one? Uh, time is ordered. In our view, one time point precedes another. So we know what came before and what came after. And this is closely bounded to the notion of causality. So something that causes something typically precedes it, right? And it causes something afterwards. And time is continuous, but we break it apart into discrete components for analysis. So we're not, <clears throat> we're not analyzing continuous time. We're always breaking this into discrete events. Now, of course, depending on what your analysis tasks are, those discrete events might be very, very small. In the stock market, um, I think it's three milliseconds now between transactions or something like that is sort of the minimum. So you have these people that are always trying to analyze the very small time scale of the stock market and the very long-term trends, right? If I know this stock is going to increase by one cent in the next three milliseconds, if I have a million dollars and it only is increasing by one cent, I've still made that one cent on that million dollars. So if I can keep making even small amounts of money very quickly, it's all going to add up. So you can think about analysis at different scales. Time is also cyclical. Today is Monday. Seven days from now will also be Monday. Are there certain events that always occur on a Monday? And to some extent, time is often thought of as independent of location, at least in terms of things like the stock market. We also can get to more complicated analysis where we're looking at how space has an impact on time as well. So linear time, we assume some starting point. And that's going to define the time domain with data elements from the past and future. Uh, natural processes may be cyclical, so we have summer, winter, spring, fall. And we can try radial layouts for that, but depending again on how we bin our different data, different patterns emerge. So this is a starting point for a radial layout for time, for each sort of spiral in my graph, each bin in that spiral is a different uh, day. And this one is laid out, I think this is a nine day sort of increment. And here's a 14 day sort of increment. And you can see the different patterns emerging along those different chunks of the day depending on how we change our different bidding. Standard representation, again, we get back to our graph, right? We have our 2D, we have x-axis is typically time, y-axis is some count, some statistical measure. So the number of arrests per day, the value of my stock market <clears throat> per minute. And again, we can think about tick marks, graph labels, aspect ratio, and all those things we've talked about and how to design an appropriate visualization.
And there's extensions to all these sorts of things. Um, there's Sparkline, where they're combining this sort of very small timeline trend with a particular word, as well as giving a count or a value at a certain point in time. You can look at things like Theme River, so trying to combine a whole bunch of different timelines together, showing how these <laughs> ebb and flow and merge in and out. Um, other techniques proposed were things like slicing the, um, sizing the horizon. Again, we have limited screen space, so what if I can put all of my data from this timeline here onto one single row? And so here they suggest um, cutting off the different peaks and putting them inside of their other ones. So we can size the horizon in this way and reorganize our data. So here I take the um, blue peak and I place it inside of my blue peak here. So now the value is going to be the height of the dark blue peak plus the height of the light blue peak. And the same with the reds. You can think about things like calendar-based visualization. So Yark Van Wick um, suggested doing this sort of thing where we <laughs> take our data, we plot by week maybe, we then also can add a histogram to the side. So here I'm showing two weeks of data on the x-axis. I'm plotting um, by every two week interval on the y-axis. So this is a sum of number of crimes on a Sunday, again, sum of a number of crimes on another Sunday, sum of the crimes in this two week period is on this axis. And so we can look at different sorts of combinations. We can think about how we can combine these different visualizations that we've been seeing to make new visualizations. Now, are these more effective? Those are the sorts of things we need to think about in designing these. And instead of combining things to make new visualizations, a common theme is to use coordinated multiple views. So taking a lot of these different visualizations and combining them through interaction. There's no real best visualization. I can't come to you and say, oh, if you use this visualization, it'll solve 100% of your problems. Um, but maybe we can think about multiple ways to look at the data and multiple ways to link those together. And given the multivariate nature of data, a single statistical graphic is not going to be enough. Um, instead, visual analytics wants to add that interaction because this can then provide multiple representations of the data. And then we coordinate these through our interaction. So if I select data points in one visualization, it'll highlight those in the next. So we get these coordinated views. If I filter something in one view, it filters all the points in another view. And this then leads to interaction. So if I'm going to have these coordinated multiple visualizations, what are my sorts of interaction types? And um, one example um, would be from Dix and Ellis. This was how to add value to static visualizations through simple interaction. And they listed some interaction types as highlighting and focus, drill down, so you may hyperlink an item, you want overview, changing parameters, changing representation, and temporal fusion. So how do we think about interacting with the data? Well, one thing that people always want to do, right, is compare. So how do we allow people to perform comparisons in the data? And then people want to sort their data into certain categories, certain orders, certain ways. How do we facilitate this sorting? How do we facilitate filtering if I want to only want to look at a subset of my data? And then how do I um, facilitate highlighting, aggregation, zooming, and panning? So there's all these different interaction types, but we only sort of have a few input modalities for interaction. The most common one is using our mouse, right? So what's my mouse click tied to? Does it tie to highlighting my data? Does it hide, <laughs> tie to filtering my data? If I'm in my Google map and I double click, it zooms. But if I double click a point in my Google map, does that highlight the point, select it? Um, what happens with these different things? How do we set up our different interactions? And really the key here is user intent. What do we think the user is intending with that interaction? And can we focus on what a user wants to achieve? Um, interaction is being done by a person for a purpose. They're not just moving their mouse and clicking randomly. They're trying to achieve something. They're seeking more information in some way. They want to solve a problem and they want to do this exploratory analysis, and overall they're really forming some sort of analytic discourse. They're walking through a path through their data, they're trying to build a mental model of their data, understand their data. Um, so um, Yi and Stasco have broken down interaction into sort of a taxonomy of seven different categories. Um, they would label this as select, explore, reconfigure, encode, abstract, filter, and connect. And so again, all of these slides, I know there's a high level overview, these will be available soon. They all have the different references to these if you want to drill down into more information as well.
So with visual analysis versus visual analytics, we talked about the choice of visual representation is going to influence the user's analysis. If I only have a histogram, then every problem is going to look like that, right? If I only have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So depending on my visual representation bag of tricks, it's also going to influence how the user is going to do their analysis. <clears throat> we talked about how we can massage the data doing power transformations to help improve visual representation. And doing those transformations also can make some data analysis methods easier like we talked about. Adding interaction is going to allow a user to sort of form and explore their own hypotheses. It allows them to manipulate <clears throat> sort of views of the data to explore. But again, how do we find important features of the data? What do we mean by important 50 minutes? <laughs> and how do we um, express that to them? So data mining um, is a domain for examining data, looking for patterns and anomalies. And um, Daniel Kaima suggested the visual analytics mantra where we should analyze first, present the most important um, zoom filter analyze again. And we can use this to enhance visualization, show us what's important, and it can also be used in exploratory analysis. I think this is interesting. Show me things that are similar to this. I shouldn't have to necessarily explore for all the things similar if I can somehow ask the question of the system to show me things that are similar. So we can think about what questions do we tend to ask in an analysis. Well, we want to say what's close in the data set, what points are close, what data elements are close or nearby or similar. What, what is this trend? If I have time, what's this trend? Are there other data elements, other variables that have a similar trend? If I have geographic data, are there neighboring regions that look the same? So we can try things like k-means clustering. Um, we partition our data into k groups and we see which things are closest. So all this is doing is taking these K groups and it's saying in group number one, and these elements were closest to each other. There's drawbacks, of course, to all these different data mining methods. Some of them depend on whether the data is normal or not. Um, here, K means uses Euclidean distance metric and you have to know K. So you have to define that somehow. Why do I think there's seven clusters in the data? Maybe there's not. Um, but we can try all sorts of different things. So I could take my data in my multidimensional space cluster it, project down onto the map, and now I could see spatially where things were close in the multidimensional space. So in this green blob here, those counties were close to each other in that multidimensional space. But also that green blob up there had similar multivariate properties as this green blob. So I can start thinking about why that's the case. Are there underlying environmental factors there? <clears throat> Other sorts of things I can begin doing this reasoning and exploration. And I don't have to be constrained to k-means. I can try all sorts of different clustering. I could do hierarchical clustering. I could produce a set of nested clusters organized as a tree. So instead of getting my k by guessing on k or having a user define k, I can explore my dendrogram and do different cuts to see these different clusters in the hierarchical space. And in these high dimensional clusters, one of the problems is we don't necessarily have a concept of how far away two points are. So here, just because this county was green and this county was green, I don't know what that distance in that multivariate space means. All I know is that they were closer than, this was closer to being in green than it was to being in orange for whatever reason. What that closeness means um, is often difficult to communicate to the end user. And we have all sorts of metrics for determining closeness. You can think about things like Euclidean, Manhattan, Canberra binaries, all sorts of distance metric, all sorts of different uh, machine learning tools that you can apply. You need to think about why you're applying it, how you're going to communicate this to an end user. In temporal analysis, a lot of questions we ask depend on trajectory. So can we apply things like time series similarity? So if I say, okay, Apple stock is decreasing. Are there other ones that are decreasing? Are there other ones that are increasing? What's similar? Uh, one common metric is sequential normalized metric. And there's a whole body of time series similarity metric work, but essentially this is trying to take a look at the data, normalize it by mean and standard deviation, and see how far apart these time series trends are. And key temporal questions often are, what's the magnitude of my change? What's the shape of the change? How fast is this change? And what's the direction? Is it changing up, down, increasing, decreasing? <clears throat> 
And so if I do this, what's 75% similar look like? So here I'm looking at um, housing, housing prices in 1998 to 2007. So I said, okay, show me all the ones that are 75% similar to Reagan County. This is what 75% looks like. Is that really what the analysts wanted? Do they understand what 75% means? So again, just because I say I want something that's 75% similar, how does that translate into this sort of picture and does that match the analyst's mental model? Um, we can also look at temporal methods for finding anomalies. We can use control chart methods. Um, doing a statistics, so we can take a look at the mean and standard deviation of a value. So each day I'm measuring my stock market. I can see what the average value for my stock is over the last seven days. I can look at the standard deviation of the last seven days. And if today is more than three standard deviations higher than yesterday, that's odd. That's a um, statistical anomaly. And we can look at applying these different sorts of things to look for anomalies and problems within our data. So. Visual analytics is trying to combine a very wide breadth of topics. We have different visual representations. We have perception, statistics, HCI, machine learning, cognition, all sorts of these different things that we've touched on just briefly in these last two hours. Um, these are some of the more commonly used methods. Again, these aren't the end all be all by any means. What we want you to take away from this is there's sort of a whole bunch of different things you can choose from to think about how you're going to design your visual analytics system, and then to use these to build upon to make more and better visual representations, better analytic tools, and how do we improve on that? So we won't go through our walkthrough example because it's lunchtime. Okay.